Joe, thank you so much for uh, jumping on a Zoom call with me. Uh, today, actually, I'd like to have a conversation with you and on maybe and how can fresh grads or students even uh, reached out to professionals on LinkedIn to whether it's asking for favors or reaching out for a request, right? So I know that you have been doing some talks with students from different universities. Maybe before we get started with my questions, you can quickly introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. So thanks so much for having me, Charmaine. Great catching up with you. So I wear many hats simultaneously. I teach at several business schools and universities around the world. I own a company called Esco Media, and we have a training company, a copywriting company, and a media company. All right, cool. I've seen some of your posts, and I think one of my one of your posts actually got me to comment because I have students reaching out to me all the time, a few times a year. I would say almost every month I have at least one inquiry, uh, and a lot of times when they reach out, they are asking for favors for a free talk or free training, and I think there are better ways to do it. I I see a certain. I wouldn't say it's a consistent way that they are reaching out, but it's quite similar the way that they reach out. So I was thinking maybe you can share with our audience. And I do have a lot of students in my LinkedIn connections who I met, who have mentored before and in the different schools. And maybe you can share some tips on how they can reach out to ask for favors. I know that you have a topic as well on uh, introverts, right? For introverts, maybe you can share a little bit about how students should approach professionals on LinkedIn. Yeah, so very good question. I think the biggest mistake, and I'll use myself as a scapegoat, is like you said, they're thinking about it from their point of view. What can I get out of this without thinking about the other party? So the question I always have all my students do before they do any kind of outreach or any kind of external communications is what's in it for them. So what's in it for the person you're reaching out to? Because like you said, 90% of the time we're thinking about it from our point of view, what we want, right? We want a job, we want a coffee meetup, we want insight into the, the company. But the person on the other side probably doesn't care much about that. They're thinking about their own trials and tribulations on a regular basis. So the question then becomes, how can you add value to them? Now, many of my students say, oh, I'm too young. I can't add any value. I don't know enough. And funny enough, I was hosting a CMO roundtable just a couple months ago. And I asked the CMOs, what do you struggle with most? And many of them said, hey, I really struggle with understanding Gen Z. I don't really know what the platforms they're on, how they communicate, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, bingo. There is a golden opportunity for you to come in and say, hey, CMO or hey, finance leader, I know many of you are trying to reach my target audience. If we catch up, I'm happy to share um, some of the, the platforms we're using, how we communicate, the jargon and terminology, et cetera, et cetera. I can help you with that if you're interested. And most of the executives are going to say yes, because once again, there's that gap between their understanding and what's actually going on the ground now with Gen Z. So that's just one example in which you can add value as, as a student. So another question, maybe it's a follow-up question. Besides, okay, actually, to be very honest with you, the student did say that I could go and network. So what is it in for me? He, he said that you could network or you could come and network. Okay, so to me, I felt a little bit like, I, I would say like, why would I want to network with students, right? Besides the point where we are really trying to understand what platforms they are using, but there must be a platform for you to have that conversation with them. They might not be ready to share as well. And they might not be sharing objectively from a point of view of a business owner or how an agency owner can help their clients with the knowledge and insights that they have gotten with just a maybe a 15-30 minute session after the training that they want you to conduct and, and have a mini short networking session. So I think, yeah, I think one point that you said was really good was come from the perspective of what is it in for the person that you're asking a favor from. That is really good. But should they say that you can come and network? I think that's my, what do you think? Like I'm trying to understand a Gen Z's point of view when they say that. So yeah, I, I'm thinking about it from an executive's point of view. I'm trying to think the same thing. Why, once again, I love the students, but why would I network? Why would I network with them? 
like I said, I'm happy to share any insights and things like that, but why would I network them? So there's a couple of different ways. I think another big challenge that all executives are facing is hiring young talent. A lot of them struggle with that. They always say there's a talent limitation, particularly in Singapore. That could be one insight is to, hey, get to know some of the, the best and brightest minds if you're hiring for interns or fresh executives, we can help you get access to them. So that could be one thing that's in it for them that's across the board, many executives are struggling. One thing that worked on me, I could share a story. I was asked by one of the student clubs, this was several years ago, to come present. And they had a panel that so was me and then someone from LinkedIn and then someone on the agency side. And it was actually my buddy on the panel at LinkedIn. So I said, okay, my buddy's on there. I haven't caught up with him for a while. I'm happy to catch up. And so it was more in terms of me catching up with my buddy and then, okay, yeah, bonus, I get to share any insights with students. So I think that in a way could be a, um, an example of networking because I was networking with my peers and maybe sharing something of value, hopefully to the students at that university. One thing that I realized that of the students who are reaching out to me is, number one, they did not uh, address upfront that they would like this as a favor, meaning that there's no honorarium or there's no fee involved. Do you think that's something that they should mention upfront? Yeah, because as business owners, as executives, <laughs> we usually ask the question, is, is it pro bono or is, or is it paid? Yeah. If it's pro bono, then yeah, they might want to highlight that. But mm -hmm. saying, look, we don't necessarily have any budget okay. because we're a student club, but here is three potential things we could do based on our understanding of your business, of looking at your LinkedIn profile, of your uh, post. Here's three things that we think might get value out of it. So that could be one option. It's not monetarily, but other value. Honestly, for me, even if there's nothing I can get out of it, I'm willing to do it. My, I think the thing that I have an issue with is the way that they write to me and they don't even mention it. And you have to ask. It's, I have to ask whether or not it's a, a paid or like a complimentary kind of a talk. So I think I would appreciate it if they just tell me up front that we do not have a budget. Even if there's nothing in for me, they could ask a favor. I thought it. I thought if you need a favor, just say it as it is that you need a favor. I don't really necessarily have to tell you like what is it in for you because I also run a social enterprise before. And at a point of time when we didn't have budgets for training programs for youth at risk, we were asking for favors as well. And upfront, I'll tell them that these are for use at risk. We do not have a budget. Uh, but if we do have an honorarium, we will tell them that we do have an honorarium. It's not much, but we hope that this helps you in some ways in your transport and your time and to appreciate you in your time, right? And there could be other ways that you can come up with something as well. Maybe when you say three things for you, it could be we could do a shout out on our social media to give you a big thank you. We could give you a small gift of appreciation, right? We could ask our, maybe our lecturer or our dean, right? Something to appreciate your time. But honestly, for me, I think if there's really nothing in from me and you tell me upfront, I'm willing to do it. And I've been doing that. I've been doing talks. I've been doing, but I think the issue that I have is when they're not open enough to tell me upfront. And at the end of the day, when you you didn't even say no, but they just upfront tell you that hey, but you could actually network with the students here, and I'll be like a big question mark. Yeah, interesting. I think your first point was to reach out and tell them what is it in for them. I think that's a good point to note. And the second point I think would also be open to tell the business owner, the trainer, the professional upfront that we do not have a budget, but we will appreciate your time to value it to us. I think the third thing, which is quite important if the students have and they should mention, would probably be that if they got your contact from someone, for example, there's, there was a student who got my contact from his dad and I know his dad from a work trip. But he didn't mention about his dad at all. So upfront, I was like ready to say no uh, to the engagement, to the request. But then I realized that, hey, but a few weeks back, my friend mentioned that hey, his kid might be reaching out to me. So I, because the surname was not reflected on LinkedIn, right? So I know my friends. So I was like, okay, better double check before I just reject, right? So I double check my friend, is your, is, is your son's name, etc. And he said, yes. So that 
puzzled me a little bit because he could have used that and he could easily have gotten a yes. Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. I think there's nothing wrong. It goes back to your earlier point about being transparent. There's nothing wrong with name dropping. Same thing. If it was, let's say it was one of my clients, their kids, so I'm definitely very highly likely to do it. I, but even, even if it's my other students, so it's a student that I don't know, but one of my students referred them to. So I still feel obliged to anyone who's been in my classes. So if they say, hey, one of your students told me you were great. And so I wanted to buy you a blah. Then I feel more obliged to do it because I'm obliged to my students. So yes, name dropping can definitely be super, super beneficial. Yeah, don't name drop for the sake of name dropping. But in your case, yeah, correct. a student actually recommended it to his or her fellow peer in school of a club, I think that would re- make a lot of sense and connection to even say yes to, to this person. So maybe just to share a little bit more, do you have any other tips for students as they reach out to ask for favors to a professional, especially if it's a training and engagement and especially if it's face-to-face, I think that requires a lot of time, travel and everything. For me, I'm a little bit more open if it's a webinar and they need an hour and a half, even two hours. For me, I volunteer my time with NGOs, nonprofits. If the school is even in Thailand, I, I do volunteer my time. But I think in Singapore, I don't know whether to bracket everyone in the same group, but just the consistency of the request I'm getting in the last two to three years. Firstly, I, I don't feel any sincerity. They could have, I wouldn't call it like name drop, but they could have given a little bit more context of why they even reached out to me, right? Or you or whoever who is a, a professional that they're trying to reach out to. And what could have been done better? Maybe if you can share some key overarching principles as they reach out to um, someone that they are trying to ask a favor from. Absolutely. And I give the same analogy in my sales training of you're asking a favor on the first date or essentially like getting down on one knee and asking someone to marry you. It's a little bit abrupt. And if you don't, if you haven't built out that relationship beforehand, it can be quite awkward for both parties because they don't know if you're going to say yes, you're, oh, I don't know this person, et cetera. So one thing, advice I always give my students is start building your list. If you are looking to join a particular company, find out who the hiring manager is or find out who the head of that department is, maybe who's the managers in that. Start following them on LinkedIn. Hit that bell notification to make sure you get notified anytime they post. Start engaging with them that way. Start adding value by commenting on their post, sharing it, liking it. That is the best way to build that rapport before you even ask for a favor. Because at that point, they're like, okay, who's this person that keeps engaging with my post? And it's happened to me before. Some students do that who are not my my class, but they've consistently commented sincerely, not just, hey, great post, don't do that. But hey, I really enjoyed this post because blah, 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 blah. By doing that, I'm like, okay, I, now I feel obliged because this person has spent their time engaging in my post, sharing it. So now I feel like I owe them a favor. So that concept of reciprocity is what we talk in my class. That's a great example of that, that um, many of my students and other students should be leveraging. Okay, good, fine. How about the method of reaching out? Should they be reaching out on LinkedIn purely on LinkedIn, or should they ask for a a quick call, a Zoom call to explain about this, or even put a presentation, a a very quick presentation together on what they're asking for? These are things that I think if I see it, I see the sincerity of your planning and your effort in putting these things together to ask for a favor, I would be more inclined to say yes. And some of them, they actually send a proposal over but there's so much spelling errors. And I'm, I'm just like, I don't know what to say, like whether to correct the spelling error or, or just say yes. So what do you think about the methods that they could? I, I personally, I feel that LinkedIn can be the first touch point. And I like how you mentioned to follow and engage if they have that lead time just for a week or so, at least there's some touch point. And What's the next method after reaching out on LinkedIn? The first step is to get spell check or Grammarly for free. <laughs> Leverage that before you send it out. But I think going back to your first point about training proposal. So shout out to the, I, I, sorry, ISIC, which is a student organization. 
So they had a very comprehensive proposal in terms of what's the event, who's going to be there, where it's going to be featured, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they did an excellent job in terms of planning. And I was like, okay, you guys put great effort in this. You picked me for hopefully a good reason. But the question was, should you reach out on LinkedIn? I think if they're active on LinkedIn, it's not always the case. So LinkedIn is definitely one that I always is the go-to. Another thing you could do is check with your alumni office to see if they have any good connections that we can introduce you to. Most of them are quite happy to do that. Either that or the career services. They can say, hey, you know what? Yes, so-and-so is a graduate. We're all happy to introduce you or happy to at least connect you to. So that could be an additional avenue if they're not active on LinkedIn is to check with your career or alumni office. Now, the next step is once you've connected with them and you've engaged with their post, how do you get that insight? And this is something I, once again, I tell all my students and training participants is to always ask for consent the way they want it. So I always ha hate when people say, hey, let's jump on an hour. <laughs> Someone reached out to me recently and said, hey, can we jump on an hour call? I'm like, if you just drop me an email, I'm happy to do it that way. So I always, if I'm doing it, I would ask, okay, hey, what, I've asked the question first, make sure I'm highlighting the value. Then I would say, which format do you prefer? Do you prefer I send the questions via uh, LinkedIn, email? You want to jump on a call? Do you want to come down to our school? Which would you prefer? I want to make sure it's super convenient for you. And um, you're so that can a, a free engagement, like no payment or with. Yeah. Once again, you have to understand like the ask. The bigger the ask, the lower the conversion rates. But you want to think about what you want to get out of this. If you just want to build the connections and you want some insights, a lot of my students just, I will happy to reply to them on an email or a LinkedIn message. I'm still, or I'll give them some resources of things that I've done previously. I still feel like I'm hopefully adding value to them, but I may not have an hour or two hours to do the presentation because I spent a lot of time um, doing that because all of them are customized for the situation. That's baby steps I could ask instead of just jumping and saying, hey, can you come do a two-hour talk for our club? It's, it's a big ask. And for many executives, who are very time-starved as it is, it's a tough ask. So if you can get to baby steps first, and then once you've warmed them up, say, hey, thank you so much. We're having an event in a few months. We're happy to invite you if you're interested. Some additional tips in there, hopefully. So do you think they shouldn't look students or especially students, they shouldn't look at this on a very short timeline. Uh, if they know that this year, there's really something that you are looking at, try to plan earlier and also to get connected earlier with people on LinkedIn. Generally, don't look at a problem and then immediately you need a solution. But uh, what are some things that they can plan ahead, like a long-term strategy on LinkedIn? What would some of your thoughts be for students, especially if they are a student leader or leading a club? Yeah, I'm going to pick on some of my students. I usually pick on myself, but I'll pick on them this time. Many of them have a, are very bad procrastination, which means they'll wait to the very end. Of what, once they're about to graduate, then they'll start taking out the messages. And at that time, your mindset is very different. Your mindset is, I need to get a job. I need to get out of my house or I need to get my visa. Whatever I need to get, I need to get it. So you're in that kind of anxiety mode. And it shows when you're seeing the outreach. If you are a senior, okay, start now. But if you are a freshman or you are year one, start building those relationships now such that whenever you graduate, you don't have to be chasing people down or sending desperate um, invites. So that's the advice I would give is to start as early as possible. In fact, I do some um, work, some of the high school, what do you call them? Yeah, high school students. They already have LinkedIn profiles now. They're already creating content. If you're in your university, not to say that you're too late, but start ASAP to your point, have that long-term mindset. Because we're just looking for a short term in terms of what can you get out of it within the first month from the first interaction with that person. It's going to be, it's going to be bad for you because you're going to have the very wrong mindset. You want to think of it as a long game. Your career should be a long game. It shouldn't be, what can I get in this instance? So that's the advice I would get is to start as early as possible. Just like investing, start as early as possible. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they should 
be starting early if especially if they are just starting in their tertiary education, whether it's in polytechnic, in university, once they start, they should be active on the platform in 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 a case of a job hunt or just being on the lookout, being connected with professionals, they should probably be exploring LinkedIn. The second thing I'm hearing from you, you're saying that they should start creating content. What kind of content do you think they should be uh, posting? Maybe just share with us broadly so one thing i always tell my students is hopefully you're learning something in class i hope that at least my students are le- learning something in class so even that's the most basic thing it's just once a week or maybe a couple times a month sharing your biggest learning from the class because not everyone has access to higher education that's one so if you are fortunate to, to get access to higher education you're almost doing your part for society and for your future career in sharing what you've learned. I would even tell my students to take that one step further. So those who have done really well in a presentation, I encourage them because a lot of my students have spent hours upon hours around building these beautiful, comprehensive presentations on real life companies. I said, you've done the work. I've given you the green light. You've done well. Reach out to the person at that company. So if it's Uniqlo or it's Samsung or it's whatever company that we're doing, reach out to them and say, hey, you know what? In my marketing class, we put together this presentation. And if you're interested, I'm happy to share it with you. That's one additional way to just, that's your concept you already have. You already have presentations you're doing. If it's good, share it with, with executives because most executives like new ideas. Should they be posting on their own LinkedIn as a PDF document just to share with the publicly on LinkedIn? They can, they can, or they can, what I do is have snippets of it. You don't have to post like the entire thing if it's like 20, 30 slides, but maybe where's the top three or four up to five slides as a carousel or PDF that would be interest to that target audience. So they could share it that way, just uploading it directly from their post. Or they could do direct message outreach to the people at that organization. But I would both do both in tandem, like a two-prong approach. Should they put a disclaimer on the document as uh, before they post it up on LinkedIn? This is a school project or something along the line that this is my, whether it's a school or maybe they have graduated and they attended a workshop that is teaching them how to put together a marketing proposal or a marketing advertising plan. Should they put a disclaimer somewhere? What should they say? Yeah, I think it's I think it's always helpful to add a bit of context. So this is from my marketing strategy class. So this is from my career, whatever it was, workshop that I was part of. This is what I built. I think yes, providing that context, that disclaimer, can be super helpful just to give people help people understand where it's coming from. Okay, maybe we will wrap this session up. Thank you so much for sharing all those insights. Maybe we will wrap it up with one motivation or something that you like to motivate the students to do moving forward with LinkedIn online, building their own network or just the way that they can reach out and connect with professionals and asking for favors? I'd say two two things. And this is these two things have had the biggest impact on all my students over the years. Number one is the first thing I talked about, what's in it for them? Don't send a post or don't publish a post. Don't send a message without answering that question. Number two is to get the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It sounds, again, now it's going to sound like a very cheesy title. It's an old book, but it's had a massive impact on on my my career. It's completely changed the way I think. And a lot of stuff isn't revolutionary, but it's the things we forget, like asking the question, what's in it for them? Little things like that, trust me, have a massive impact in terms of your overall career for the long term. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe, for sharing with us. And I think they should continue to reach out, just be more tactful and thinking about the points of what is it in for them, getting connected early, showing up on LinkedIn, building their profile. If a student reached out to me and I click, I would definitely click through their LinkedIn if they reached out to me on LinkedIn. And I will definitely take a look at what they have been posting. And if they have been posting nothing, it, it's lesser incentive for me to work with a student who doesn't have a, a presence online, a, a brand online, right? Whatever, whether you show up or not, that is your brand. People think that if they don't show up, oh yeah, I'm okay, I'm good. But that is your brand. You are not showing up on online. So thank you so much for sharing these small tips. 
I have one fun yeah. final comment. And this is a pe- pet peeve. Always send a thank you note. Always. Of all the pe- people I've, I've helped over the years, I think maybe 5% will send a thank you note. 1% will send an update over the longer term. So if you want to make a, a good impression over a longer term, always send a thank you note. So Charmaine, with that, thank you so much. Thank <laughs> really you. really appreciate you having me on. And I look forward to catching up soon. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right.